taken from uh, the 25th chapter of Genesis. And it has to do with uh, the birth of Esau and, and Jacob. These are the descendants of um, Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Pada Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Aramean, excuse me. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer. And his wife, Rebekah, conceived. The children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? Maybe some of you uh, men I know have not had that experience. So maybe you, some of you as women have had that experience where you've been get, getting kicked pretty regularly. And someone said, how do you know that you have twins? And someone who had twins, she said, you know when you get kicked four times from different directions. And evidently, Rebecca's having that happen to her. The stru children struggled together within her, and she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red. All his body was a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. The word of God for all the people. We will be in a moment of prayer together. Now may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. You who are our rock and our redeemer. We're in that series, it's the third one in our series of uh, family reunion in a sense about some of the Old Testament characters who are part of our history. Focus the first week on Abraham and the second week on the mother of laughter, Sarah. And we talked about uh, the marriage of Sarah and Abraham somewhat. It was not the, uh, not the smoothest of marriages. Abraham, remember, was uh, at one time uh, pawned his wife off as his sister to protect his own skin. And then another time as well. And, uh, and then they had a, a long time of barrenness, even though they'd been promised a child. Finally, Isaac is born. And Isaac is, uh, when he grows up, Abraham nearly sacrifices him. God comes in and intervenes. So uh, I'm not sure what Sarah was thinking when Isaac was taken off by Abraham to be sacrificed. But I think there perhaps was always some tension between the two of them. Now Isaac is getting 40 years old and we're going to look at another marriage and uh, you know marriages are uh, 
are kind of the fodder of comedians. I mean, they're, they're, comedians love to tell jokes about marriages. Um, one joke is uh, Rita Rudner used this classic. My mother buried three husbands. Then she adds, and two of them were just napping. <laughs> One woman said to a friend, I'm in trouble. I broke my husband's favorite golf club. And what did he say? Her friend asked, and the first woman smiled and replied, he said, what hit me? Irma Bombeck had this to say. She said, people are always asking, how do you stay married for a quarter century or more? And she said, my secret was, I am a forgiving woman. I forgave my husband after a week that he was not Paul Newman. <laughs> and one of my soul said, I married Miss Wright. I just didn't know her first name was always. <laughs> Finally, one man claims that uh, it's no coincidence that June, the month of marriages, is followed by July, the month of fireworks. <laughs> well, Isaac is single. He's now 40 years old. And Abraham realizes that if the promise of God is to be fulfilled, Isaac needs to find a wife. And so he calls one of the trusted servants of himself and said, I want you to go to the far country, not to the Canaanites or not to any other pagan religion, but to the people, to my people, our people. And I want you to pick out a wife for Isaac. The way it sometimes was done at that time, and arranged marriages. I don't. I, th I think there's one or two people in this church that nearly had arranged marriages from having talked to them in the past. Now, arranged marriages have about the same percentage of success as us picking out our spouse. Slightly higher. A better percent, actually. But I would have hated to have somebody arrange my marriage. I don't know about you. But I, I, I kind of enjoyed trying to find a person that I wanted to marry. And, uh, but Isaac doesn't do that. The servant goes off, and, he, and Abraham tells him, he said, an angel is going to go along with you to guide you and help you to select the right person. So he, he's praying and he goes and uh, he has a prayer that says that if, if at the well where I'm going to go, there's someone comes out and offers to give me a drink of water and even says, I will water your camels if you'd like. That's the one I'm going to investigate and uh, sure enough he gets there and Rebecca comes out and she's quite beautiful she said may I offer you a drink of water and may I as well water your camels it was midday and the women tended to go out to that well at midday and he knew this was an answer. And so he said, I, I would like to speak to your family. So he goes and he asks for her hand. And then it says he puts a ring in her nose, which I hope wasn't a, a ring like what we used to have in the nose of the bull on our farm, you know, to drag her, but he puts a ring in her nose. And, and they say that, yes, she, she can go with you if she wants. And they left it up to Rebecca, and Rebecca said, I will go with you. And they head off in the distance. Isaac sees them coming, and he's quite interesting now, because he's, he's having part of the search, 
and he sees Rebecca, and, and, and even though she has a veil over her face, he's struck by the way she walks. And uh, soon they are married. And he takes her into his mother's tent. His mother has died, is the phrase that's used. And it seems like this is going to be a good marriage. And they begin to have a problem, can't have children. Remember Isaac's about 40 at this time. The years roll by. Rebecca's barren. It's about 20 years later. Rebecca gets, becomes pregnant. In fact, Isaac prays to God, please allow her to have children. Take away her barrenness. And, uh, and she has, she becomes pregnant, and inside of her, she's aware of a struggle. And it's almost like, well, there's, there's two, the twins are inside her. She realizes, she doesn't know if they're twins or triplets or whatever, but there's more than just one person. And as this struggle's going on, she has a, she prays. And she is said, told in this prayer, the older one will serve the younger one. The, that, it wasn't too long ago, actually, in some of our states, that everything went to the older child. You know, if you were the older child, you cut things. And, uh, and in that day, the older child got it all. Got the blessing, got, got everything. So the birth finally comes to take place. When it does, the very first one child that comes out is Esau, or the name of Esau, because he is red, rooty, and he's quite hairy. I imagine a yeah, flaming red head, you know? Some children come out balder than you will bring her, and some come out looking like the Beatles. And then the second child comes, and the second child has a hold. Oh, you tight your shoelaces it's on too tight. Has a hold of the heel of the other one. He's grasping the heel. So they name him Jacob which means heel grab. <laughs> so they both were named after this birth. Ready, Rudy, Esau, and heel grab. But at this point, even in, in Rebecca's mind, in the back of her mind is that uh, the younger one has been called by God to be the leader of the nation. Now Esau is an outdoor, he's, he is a, he loves the outdoors, loves hunting, loves fishing. He's a member of the National Rifle Association. He has three guns on the back of his pickup. It's incredible wherever he goes and he just enjoys being out there. He doesn't want to do anything with the household or anything. And Jacob hates the whole idea of going out into the field and sticking his hands into the ground to do any gardening. You know, that's not, that's not for him. I have a, a dentist who, uh, <laughs> funny, he, he says, uh, I don't like the garden because I don't like to put my hands in the dirt. And I thought, John, you put the hands in people's mouths all day. What's, you know, is there a whole lot different? But anyway, uh, he, he is, he enjoys being inside. Learns to cook. And so what happens, uh, 
Isaac is an outdoorsman. He falls in love. He favors Esau. Rebecca, she favors Jacob. And uh, I don't think that's ever a good prescription for a family, uh, parents to favor one child or another. But, but sometimes you do. Your personality goes, and, and you notice sometimes if you've ever had more than one child, or two or three, that sometimes mom or dad always sees sparks with one of them. Or dad does. And it takes the two to be there. You don't try to be favorites, but some are just easier to parent. And uh, they grow up. And then uh, Jacob's clever. He's already a heel grabber, if you will. He's smart. He's uh, maybe missing something. There comes a time in the growing up that uh, Esau has come in from hunting. He's not had any success. Well, caught nothing. Hungrier than a bear. He comes home. He says, I'd do anything. He smells the porridge that his brother's making. He said, I'd do anything for a bowl of soup. You? Really? <laughs> Would you trade your birthright? Yeah. I'd give up my birthright. I don't want to die. I got to eat. So he swaps a bowl of porridge for his birthright, which is a, a, a tremendous honor. I mean, a, you know, it's a tremendous privilege, this birthright. So Jacob's already got him one. And then afterwards he thinks about it and Esau says, that, that probably wasn't too smart. So it goes down a little further and Rebecca all the time is now scheming. How does she help her son receive a blessing to lead the nation? Esau is now six. He's, I mean, uh, Isaac is now 60 years old. That's at the time of the birth. So now he's about 80. He can't see very well. He realizes that his end is coming. So he calls Esau. He says to Esau, I want to give you my blessing. Will you go into the field and uh, get some venison for me? When you come back, we will feast together and I will give you the blessing. Now while he's telling this, Rebecca is eavesdropping. What's going on? So as quick as Esau heads off into the field, she calls Jacob. Jacob, come here. Quick, go get the venison skin that you that we uh, get the deer skin from the last deer that your brother killed. Put it on. Rub the smell of the outdoors on you. Get rid of your smell. Find some of Esau's clothes. Put them around you. And go in and get the blessing of your father. And, and he does this. He goes in, 
his father smells, he said, you don't smell just the same way. But he feels, Harry, yeah, Harry, it's, it's him. And so he gives the blessing, which can never be taken back. And the blessing carries tremendous power. And it's the blessing that um, makes it possible for him to be the one to carry on the name, to be the one to uh, carry the family name, if you will. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now Esau comes back and he says, I got the deer for you, Dad. Well, I'll have uh, Jacob cook it up. But Jacob's nowhere there. And his dad says, what? I've already given you my blessing. And they realize He's been tricked out of his blessing. Rachel, I mean Rebecca, has to tell Jacob, flee for your life. Because your brother's going to want to kill you. And it's many, many years later when they encounter one another again. And you don't, we don't know what the anguish was in that family until Isaac and Rebecca had died. Probably was pretty cold look that Isaac gave his wife when he realized that she had been behind tricking him. <coughs> Nicholas Bernyev, a Russian theologian, says that there are times in life when you have to have the ethics of creativity rather than the ethics of obedience. And obedience is always following the law. But there are times when you need to step outside it, which can be costly. When the nonviolent marches and some of the stance of Martin Luther King Jr. happened. He said, we will break the laws because they're unjust. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when he decided to be, even though he was a, basically a nonviolent theologian, he, he was involved in trying to kill Hitler in Germany, was arrested because of it. Because he said, sometimes you have to go beyond what the law says. And Rebecca does this. Not, not something you maybe want in your family history, or always to have to do that. But there are times when, when the, the letter of the law may not be the right thing. And uh, so Rebecca takes an action which leads, I have to say, must have led to a lot of anguish for the rest of her life. Like Mary, when she became the mother of Jesus, she was told that things were going to happen. And there was tremendous anguish oftentimes in her life. There was a time when she, he said, she's not my mother. You are my mother and brothers and sisters. And when she watched him die on the cross. But uh, Rebecca uh, fulfills a purpose here, which is uh, not, not an easy one. Now I'm going to jump ahead. This, this is a five minute synopsis. I don't know if I'm going to take five minutes. But I, I, I want to go ahead now for Jacob for a moment. Jacob's 20 years later or more. His brother is coming toward him. 
Jacob's all, Jacob goes off to get a wife. We're, we're not going to get into that next time because I want to pick up with the story of Joseph. So Jacob goes off to get a, get a wife and he gets tricked by his uncle Laban who, who has him work seven years for this beautiful woman, Rachel. And it comes the night of the wedding and he sneaks in his older daughter uh, who wasn't too good looking. And so he spends the night with her and then he realizes he's been at And, and Laban says, mm, work another seven years, you can have Rachel. And he does. And, uh, and so he, they raise a family. He becomes wealthy. There's, yeah, you need to read that in Genesis. And, uh, and then there comes the time when he's going to meet his brother for the first time since he swindled him of his birthright or his blessing. And he goes to a river, the river Jabbok. And while he's there, he has uh, someone comes into his presence, an angel of the Lord. And all night long, he wrestles with the angel. And when the morning comes, the angel's ready to leave. It's a, it's a, a major battle. And he's says to the angel, what, who are you? And the angel says, who are you? And at that point he has to say, I am Jacob. And he has to confront who he really is. I am Jacob, the heel grabber the swindler, the manipulator, the one who followed his mother's way, if you will, in my uncle Laban's. But he says, I am, that's who I am. And then the angel or God says to him, you're no longer going to be Jacob. From now on, you're going to be Israel, is your name. You know, Israel ends with E-L. And that means the Lord. That was a way that people referred, Elohim was one of the names for God. So Bethel, E-L, was the house of the Lord. Bethel was built where he had a dream about ascending and descending angels. Emmanuel, E-L, God with us. So Israel means uh, God's people, God's chosen ones. Jacob, you're no longer Jacob. From now on, you will be Israel. That's a five-minute synopsis. And now.